Hello. How are you all? Warmed up from the rally? All right, good. Hey, that's me. I don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> so, this is my first time at an American Atheist Conference that I'm not in the exhibitor hall the entire time. <laughs> that I work for American Atheists because I just started in mid-December and I get to be part of the convention, though not sitting in the audience part of the convention. It's a lot of the running around and coordinating uh, speaker PowerPoints and last minute travel updates and things like that part of the convention. But the evenings, I'm sure, uh, there'll be some more relaxation time after, after this. And it's pretty exciting. I attended, the last one I attended was uh, 2005. Before that, was anyone here in 2005 at the American Atheist Convention? Not one person? No? Oh, oh there's, yeah, there's a light. Cool, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think you've been to all of them, right? Yeah. So I thought about, uh, as a new employee to American Atheists, the new job role, this being my first convention here, what kinds of things to talk about? And Nick Fish and I talked about a couple things and he, he said, talk about your passion. So the title is Making Change One Community at a Time. I think you'll figure out soon what my passion is in this movement. And I'll start with a, a little story. So when people think about the American Civil Rights Movement, they think about events like the March on Washington in 1963. A quarter of a million people came together in our nation's capital to raise their voices together for freedom and for equality. When people think of the American Civil Rights Movement, they think about individuals, people like Rosa Parks, who sat down on a bus, right? <laughs> she refused to give up her seat at the front of the bus for a white passenger. That was against the law where she was in Montgomery, Alabama. She was arrested and fined. When people think about the American Civil Rights Movement, they may think, though I think more people are learning about this, they may think that Rosa Parks was just some woman. She was tired. It was a long day. She didn't want to get up and move. That's the story I learned in probably kindergarten and second grade and again in fourth grade and again in sixth grade at Black History Month. You know, some librarian or secretary was tired and one day she just had enough and said, nope, I'm not moving to the back of the bus. You've heard this, right? Yeah, and she was an everyday person. She came from a lower middle class, a working class background. Black woman, grew up in the South. But she did decide at some point that maybe, just maybe, there was some way that she could get involved to fight the injustices that she saw, the utter racism that permeated every aspect of her life as a black woman in the South. Maybe she could do something about this. So she joined a local group. Take a guess what my passion is. <laughs> she joined a local group. She joined the local NAACP. And eventually she became a secretary working for the local NAACP office. Years later, as NAACP secretary, as a sort of budding activist, she attended the Highlander Folk School in the mountains of Tennessee. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, you know what happened to it recently. It was uh, set on fire, or at least part of it was, the main building that had a lot of the archive materials, including materials about Rosa Parks and uh, Martin Luther King and others who spent time there was set on fire and a white supremacist symbol was spray painted outside. I think this was just, what, two weeks ago? It's tragic, a lot, of, a lot of materials lost. But back to Rosa Parks. She attended the Highlander Folk School. She went through training on racial equality and other things, activism. And she agreed with other civil rights activists in Montgomery, Alabama, that the time was ripe, once again, to try to challenge the segregation laws and the segregated buses. For sitting down in the front of that bus, Rosa Parks was arrested 
on December 1st, 1955. By December 4th, her local group and their allies and their partners were able to marshal their resources to get the word out and got it out to almost all of the black churches in the region so that on Sunday, they could tell their people what had happened and what they were going to do as a direct action campaign in response. They announced plans for a long-term bus boycott in Montgomery. Within those few days after Rosa Parks got arrested to word getting out, the organizers were able to distribute 35,000 leaflets to black residents in Montgomery area to encourage them to boycott long-term. They had to make plans for carpools. They had to reach out to black-owned cab companies who actually offered a steep discount rate. They charged what the buses would charge, something like 10 cents, um, so that people wouldn't have to pay more to take the taxi if they needed to. And a lot of people, seeing this large level of community support for this, actually just decided to walk to work. So the boycott started days after Rosa Parks' arrest. It lasted for 381 days. Now mind you, in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955, the majority of the people who took the bus were black. In some places, some routes, they said 75% of the people who took the bus were black. So those bus lines now lost 75% of their ridership. People were walking five miles to work, 10 miles to work, figuring out ways to carpool together. The bus company was interested in this ending sooner rather than later. I would say capitalism at work, but this isn't a talk about capitalism, this is a talk about activism <laughs> and racism. The Supreme Court struck down the laws that allowed the bus companies to be segregated. 381 days later. So when people think of the civil rights movement, they think about courageous individuals like Rosa Parks, people who were bold enough to sit down when they weren't supposed to and break the law, right? They don't tend to think about the people who typed up those brochures, typed up those 35,000 flyers, or photocopied them, or mimeographed them, or whatever you did with flyers in 1955 to make 35,000 of them, who distributed them to all of the different churches across the region, who made the phone calls to figure out the carpools and reach out to the black cab companies and figure out arrangements and provided support. How many people did they need to do that kind of thing? How important was that work for this to succeed, right? It wasn't just Rosa Parks sitting, it was all of the support that these local organizations, their partnering groups, groups in the region could provide to the community as well as to the NAACP locally and the people. The organizers and the volunteers had to work really, really hard to make sure that the people were supported, that they could still get to work, that they could still get to the doctor's office, that they could take care of their family, right? But when people think about the civil rights movement, they don't often think about those networks, those local and regional networks that have to exist for campaigns like that to actually work. When most people think of the civil rights movement, the picture they get in their head is probably Martin Luther King, standing on the steps at the Lincoln Memorial, 1963, and saying to the crowd, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That's what people think the civil rights movement was too often, right? They probably never think about the amount of work and coordination it took to put on a march in DC that a quarter of a million people needed to show up to. I mean, how many porta potties do you think they had to rent for that? Who made those phone calls? <laughs> how many volunteers did you need? It's August in DC, did you have water stations? <laughs> I would think of that, right? Nowadays, I would coordinate that with cell phones and uh, some nice little golf carts maybe that we could rent. We'd have to coordinate with the National Police. I don't know how it worked in 1955 or 1963 for that, but I know for a quarter of a million people to show up to something, you need a lot of coordination and messaging. Who took care of the AV? 
It's not just, I have a dream, right? When they think about Dr. Martin Luther King, they, they think about the fact, they know, we all know, that he was a brilliant orator, compelling speaker, inspirational, moving. But also, he was a thoughtful strategist and a hardworking organizer. Yes, he was able to articulate a hopeful vision, he, but he backed it up with action. It's easy for us to see the leaders and the spokespeople, the people who stand on stage and say, this is what I think the movement should be doing. This is you know, our, our glorious vision. It's hard sometimes for us to know what goes on behind the scenes, as Callie said. I'm not always the one doing that work, but yeah. All of the people that participate in these campaigns and these events and these efforts behind the scenes to make something succeed. The vast infrastructure that turns us out, right? Much of the civil rights movement, the actual moving part of the movement, took place at the community level. It took place in the streets of the small towns, in the cotton fields, at movie theaters and restaurants, in universities and cities and school buildings and churches and other places where people were allowed to gather safely, relatively safely. Before people like Martin Luther King could go to cities like Montgomery and Birmingham, there had to be some active grassroots organization on the ground. There had to be places where people could have meetings together to make plans, where they could educate their members. For Dr. King, of course, it was a lot of uh, education about nonviolent direct action, you know, how to respond when someone is pushing you down, which is don't, don't punch them back in the face. <laughs> that was a very important part of him for the training for the activists that he wanted to be working with. There had to be local organizers there, all kinds of people who could bring others together and who could figure out how best to navigate the very challenging systems that they were working in. Often their top opponents were elected officials and the police, of course. It's hard to fight the police, be on the wrong side of the police. So let's talk for a second. I wish I had to carry this lectern. I'm used to pacing, <laughs> you know, pacer talker. Let's talk about some reasons that it's important to build and support local groups. Right, this is to be a big part of what the movement part of our movement is. So one benefit, of course, that I've been talking about so far is activism. The ability for people to come together and amplify and multiply their efforts to be effective and have an impact in their communities where they are. At the rally, I talked a bit about coalitions and the importance and of the, the way that we can build power by coming together with partnering organizations and in coalitions and in groups. A second benefit is that local groups help us build community. Of course, many of us join atheist groups because we're looking to hang out with other atheists, especially in some regions of the country. It's like, dear God, let me get away from this God over here <laughs> and find some other people that have less of you in it so I can hang out. <laughs> I'm sure you know, many people who leave religion, that's a very exciting thing to do, is find people that are okay with being atheists. I meet a lot of people who move, they'll go from a more secular part of the country to the middle of Pennsylvania, <laughs> to uh, Tennessee, and they get asked, what church do you go to? And that'll be the first time that they're motivated to join an atheist group. It wasn't an issue when they were in New York City, now they're in Tennessee, they don't know where to go. So community, we know that the lack of community and social support can have negative impacts on our mental and physical health. So it's also good for us to find communities of like-minded people. A third, third uh, role that our groups fill, of course, is educational. We bring in speakers, we see movies, we have discussion group events. A lot of this is to educate ourselves and our, mem our other members, but some of this is community education, right? We want to bring in outside people and teach them about us. Bring them in for debates, bring them in for conversation. We like books, we like podcasts, we like YouTube videos, we like to learn. We're a curious bunch, we like to learn things. And a fourth role is service. Something actually I've been very glad to see an increasing amount of in our community. When I first got involved with free thought groups 19 years ago, there weren't 
a lot of groups I saw that were engaged actively in serv service. If anything, it would be adopt a highway and people would go out maybe three times a year to pick up trash, but it was more exciting to them to have their name on a plaque in their town than it was to actually clean things and make the community better. Now I see groups who think, we actually need to have an impact here. I see conventions like this one, we're going to be packing 50,000 meals on Sunday. That wasn't happening much 19 years ago when I first got involved. So more and more community groups are working with others, working often with religious organizations, sometimes the secular ones, to have an impact in their community. So that's, that's exciting. Of course, that also helps normalize atheism when we have a presence in different realms. So these four roles, by the way, are uh, part of what makes up American Atheists ACES program for affiliates and grassroots work. It's uh, activism, community service, education, and social. And the former national field organizer, Jim Helton, has been working with state directors and volunteers to build toolkits for people and collate resources for people so that they can make their groups more awesome in these different areas. Jim's observation was that groups often did really well when they, were, when they had activities in these four different areas because different things appealed to different people. Even when I was in Philadelphia working with local groups in the early to mid 2000s, for the lectures and discussion groups we saw maybe 90% of the attendees were men. As soon as the uh, group started doing service projects, it would be like 26 women would show up, three men. And we were like, have you been part of this for long? <laughs> Did you just not want to do debates and lectures anymore? And they were like, no, no, we wanted to kind of do like, you know, feed the hungry and stuff like that. So different things appeal to different people. I don't mean there's always such a clear demographic split, especially nowadays compared to 10, 15 years ago. But yeah, some things are going to attract younger people, some things are going to attract older people, some things are going to attract families. Having different kinds of activities, some activism, some service, some educational, um, some community-oriented will attract different people to your group, help it be awesome. So as is the case for this kinds of, these kinds of work, as Callie said, we don't always see the people behind the scenes. This is an aside, but this is also true in hotels. I like peeking at, through the doors when I can, don't let them know that. <laughs> to be like, what's back here in the service hallway? How's that work? What's it connect to? <laughs> because once I learned how extensive they are, I was like, oh, it's everything shiny on the outside, but there are people working really hard in the back end to make these things happen without a, a hitch, right? And uh, same thing with this conference. <laughs> lots of organizing work, uh, lots of volunteering, Things uh, like the Montgomery bus boycott had hundreds of people working at the community level, at the national level, doing a lot of hard lifting behind the scenes. It's not as sexy as putting up a billboard with a big flashy message, getting attention, saying, you know, hey, there's no God. <laughs> Guess what, y'all? <laughs> Atheists. That might have been a, a particularly sexy message, uh, 2005, 2006, up to maybe 2012. Now I think people are like, yeah, we know. We got it. <laughs> Atheists, yeah. But they got attention when people didn't know that we were out there as much, right? And it's not to say that we, we all, not just American Atheists, but other organizations too, couldn't be putting up billboards being like, hey, Atheists are here. But a lot of times, that's not investing in the kinds of infrastructure the kinds of community building that can help us when we want to have long-term impact, when we want to be able to do things like the campaigns uh, and attract people or figure out, you know, there's a bill that might pass in a state like Missouri, who can we contact who can deliver testimony on this bill? Right now, we look for group leaders and volunteer state directors and go from there to see who can do the work, because we know organizers often have the ability to get the work done. And speaking of behind the scenes work, I do wanna give a quick shout out to the many, many volunteers who are working this convention for American Atheists. Many of them are state directors and assistant state directors, and they're plus ones and spouses and partners that they dragged in and made help. 
<laughs> they're volunteering and giving hours of their time away instead of sitting here and enjoying the presentations. Uh, we've got four or so people in the registration booth. There are people that are helping out with the salons and the focus groups. So if you see some people volunteering and you're not yourself volunteering, just be like a quick, hey, thanks. Appreciate that you're helping work on this and making this such an awesome event for all of us. I don't know if can, anyone's here, but some of you have probably have been volunteering too. Maybe we can give a quick round of applause and I'll relate to the people who are volunteering for this convention. It's been amazing. They've been a very, very, very helpful. Set up a breakdown, making name tags. It's especially one special shout out to, to the two people who are doing volunteer coordination. Jen Scott and Sam McGuire. Oh my gosh, does Sam never sleep. How many of you have worked with Sam McGuire before, by the way? Goodness gracious. <laughs> she came in a van. She's like, how many Sharpies do we need? I have them all. <laughs> Here's a million. Anyway, they're, they're amazing. So organizing community groups, there are a lot of challenges out there. And even in a country, like one country with a lot of different kinds of states, a lot of different regions, the United States, there are a lot of different needs out there. A group in Middle Tennessee is gonna look very, very different than one in Arizona or Washington State, Seattle. And trying to do a national organization that doesn't have infinite resources, has lots of state directors coming from lots of different backgrounds in a pretty big country, it's very difficult. So related to that, and because we're still early in the convention and we've had some questions about this, I wanted to mention something about our data collection project. How many of you have heard about data collection that American Atheist is doing? Oh, not many. Ooh, I should have brought a, oh wait, I do have a sheet. I'll just tell you from memory. So <laughs> I mentioned I just joined American Atheist four months ago, but Allison Gill, who started last year in January, and Nick and others have been talking about doing a large data collection project, starting with focus groups at this convention. I'll do another quick survey. Who here has signed up for a focus group? Wow. Thank you. Thank you for giving your time and your feedback and your input. So we're doing 10, but I think it might be expanding to 12 focus group sessions during this convention. Uh, they're kind of themed groups so that people can feel uh, comfortable sharing things. They're hour long sessions, might go longer if there's a lot to say for the different participants. Um, asking questions about backgrounds and history and have you faced discrimination as an atheist, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't know all of the questions. I know there's a group for uh, students that's meeting. There's one that Callie mentioned for uh, people of color, which there aren't many of at atheist conventions. So they're looking to talk to people of color about some of the experiences that they might face that others don't. Um, but it's a big project. And this is phase one. We're looking at spending maybe a year to do the focus groups followed by different kinds of surveys of membership. But we don't only want to talk to people who are already plugged in as members and subscribers and supporters and conference attendees. We also need to figure out how to talk to the people who could be plugged in, who could be connected to American atheists, but aren't yet, right? And see, why aren't they? For example, I'm sure many of you are aware that young adults are more secular than older adults. The youngest millennial is the most secular by far. But they're not necessarily identifying as atheists, nor are they necessarily plugging into the atheist community. They're just not religious. It would be wonderful to talk to them about why. Is it the word atheism, atheist? Like they are afraid to identify as that? Is it just they don't care? They're in a secular enough environment that everyone's sort of individualist enough that it's like, eh, whatever. Their parents are secular, maybe that's the case. I'm a Xennial <laughs> on the cusp of Gen X Xennials. And uh, you know, maybe it's cool people like my generation, my three to six year block who's having kids now and not raising them with religion because we're the coolest six year block of generations. In case you didn't know. <laughs> it's my birthday this week, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. 
So no, it doesn't matter. It's funny, for the conventions I've been to in the past, maybe two out of three of them, my birthday has been during, uh, because it's always April 16th, so it's always like around Easter, close enough. One of these years is gonna be solidly in it and I'm having a party. <laughs> but yeah, for those who signed up for the focus groups, again, thank you. Uh, for those who didn't get the chance to, keep an eye on the surveys and things. There will be other ways to participate, and we're really looking for input. If you have supported the organization in the past, if you see us and you want to talk about things, if there's been some burning kind of suggestion on your mind or some input, you might have some insight, we're happy to hear from you. Stop by registration. You can grab us if we're, taking a, if we're sitting down on Saturday night or something like that. We're, we're looking for input. We're looking for different perspectives. We want to make sure that the work we do is relevant and, and effective, wherever it might be. We want to meet the needs of the community as it exists, the people who are currently involved, but also the needs of those who aren't involved yet. Let's see what the, the gap is there. So yeah, we'll be also continuing to develop new resources in those directions based on the feedback that we get. And then when the, the general work is done, we'll be publishing a lot of those results. So that's exciting too. This has never been done on, the, on this scale before by a national atheist or secular organization. So pretty exciting. And also, if you would like to support the project, talk to Nick, talk to me, talk to any of us. There's a lot we could do with the limitations on some of this. The, the number of people we can survey at different parts, for example, is limited by the resources we have access to. So if you'd like to, for us to be able to grab in more people, feel free to, to talk to us about how to do that. So especially considering some of the challenges that we've been facing as a result of the current administration, there's a lot that we can should be focusing on regarding state and local activism. And considering the needs of our people at the local level is an important piece of that. But, focus groups. Feel free to talk to us more about that if you have questions. And I'll end, yeah, I'm doing it on time, with a quote and a consideration. The abolitionist and author Frederick Douglass once said, I prayed for freedom for 20 years but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. Many of the organizers, activists, and local groups out there are actively praying with our legs, right? We're doing the work that we think we can do and contribute to to actually see change happen, not just in the land of ideas, but actually out there in the world. And as I said during the rally, working together we do have the power to change things where we are, wherever we are. So let's go out there, change the world. Thank you.